This UCSD TV program is a presentation of University of California Television for educational and non commercial use only. Now, uh, by way of introduction, as you probably know, we humans shared a common ancestor with the orangutan about 13 million years ago, with the gorilla about 8 million years ago, with the chimpanzee and bonobo about 6 million years ago, and with the, our closest extinct evolutionary cousin, the Neanderthal, about half a million years ago. And you'll be hearing more about uh, a lot of this along the way. Now, uh, I realize this is an audience that ranges all the way from really hardcore geneticists that know a lot more than I do, all the way to educated lay people who are interested in the topic. And so therefore, I hope the experts will bear with me while I give a sort of a general, very brief introduction to genetics. Uh, one of the problems we face in CARTA is that we have so many specialties and so many complexities and so much jargon, and that uh, even amongst ourselves, we have trouble keeping up with all the, all the jargon. So. I'm going to just give a very brief introduction and apologies to anyone who feels that it's too simplistic. As you know, there's DNA in the cell, both in the mitochondria and the nucleus. We're mainly talking about the nucleus today. Chromosomes, and where the DNA is packaged up in, by histones. And if you look at the level of uh, molecular detail, you can see the double helix with these base pairs that keep the DNA together and which uh, constitute the genetic code. And you hear a phrase like five prime to three prime, and that really tells you which strand and which direction you're running in. Now, there is this reductionist view of biology that DNA makes RNA makes protein. And there's a tendency to therefore think that cells, tissues, and organisms emanate from this simple paradigm. But that's like saying that if you have Betty Crocker's cookbook, you have a meal like that. It's a lot of other things that happen along the way, obviously. So a more uh, complete view of biology would be that uh, you also need lipids, you need glycans, you need these to come together in glycoproteins, prote glycans, glycolipids, cells, matrices, tissues, and organisms. Of course, things feed back to DNA and RNA. But don't forget the microbes and parasites, the physical environment, the diet, and in the case of species like humans, the cultural environment. So this is a more complete view of biology. But today, we are going to be a bit reductionist. We are going to focus mostly on DNA, RNA, and proteins, but keep the bigger picture in mind, and occasionally we refer to the bigger picture. As you know, uh, you, each of you have chromosomes derived from your, from your parents. And if you're male, you have a y, a y instead of two Xs. There's a mitochondrial DNA, which uh, is in all cells. And during sexual reproduction, you get uniparental clonal inheritance of Y and mitochondrial DNA, and recombination of other chromosomes can take place. So some very basic terminology, a locus on a chromosome in a genome. The genome would be all of the sequence in, in, your, uh, in your genome. So you can have a genetic locus, which can, they can have multiple loci, you'll hear this term. You can have alleles of the same gene in which you have alternate forms found in the same place in the same chromosome. You can have haplotypes, which are combinations of alleles at multiple loci that are transmitted together on the same chromosome. And from a genetic locus, very often you'll find a gene, but the gene is broken up into these exons in terms of the coding region for amino acids. And you'll hear about enhancers and promoters that affect the gene. And you translate this DNA into RNA in a primary transcript. But then you have to uh, take this messenger RNA, and you'll hear about the five prime untranslated region and the three prime untranslated region at either end of these genes. And this messenger RNA has to undergo splicing to develop a process transcript and give you a protein. But the big new elephant in the room over the last few years is the fact that a lot of our RNAs are not coding and are doing a lot of very interesting things, very important biologically. You'll hear about that. So with that very brief overview, obviously I've left out a lot of terminology, but just a few, few words to keep us uh, 
in thinking along the lines of uh, these things. We're going to have the genetics of humanness, and one of the things Elaine and I decided is to make the program sort of in this direction generally. We're starting at the big picture level with entire genomes, and then we'll work our way through segments of genomes, and then uh, you start hearing more about RNA and accelerated regions of genome, gene regulation, networks, and eventually drill down to a few examples of a single couple of single genes. And not shown in this is that the, in the final closing remarks, Pascal Gagneau will uh, put things a little bit into perspective by looking at the, at the even bigger picture. And next we have Alison Motri from here at UCSD with an exciting new report on comparisons of human and ape stem cells. I'll be talking about the use of uh, stem cells uh, as a novel tool for evolutionary studies. And this is something that was virtually impossible to think about it like three or four years ago. So, so these are human embryonic stem cells. And, uh, and a human embryonic stem cells can be isolated from the human blastocyst. So we can culture these cells into the right culture condition, the proper condition, and these cells will self-renew, and they will propagate indefinitely, and we can induce the cells to differentiate or to specialize in multiple cell types, in different cell types of the body. That's what we call pluripotency. So it's a really powerful situation because one can then use those unlimited resources of cells for, uh, for transplantation purpose, and that's what we call the regenerative medicine. So diseases such as diabetes or Parkinson, one can transplant the cells back to the patient. There is a, a, a major bottleneck on that, which is the fact that the original cells that we use here do not share the same uh, genetic background as the patient, so they will suffer uh, immune rejection upon transplantation. So this is a major bottleneck, and one way to overcome that would be uh, to isolate one uh, somatic cell, and, and this can be done with cells that are easy to collect, such as skin, and we can transform these cells in cells that are pluripotent-like or resemble human embryonic pluripotent stem cells. And if you reach into this pluripotent state, you can now induce the cells to differentiate in the tissue, uh, in the target tissue, and you can uh, overcome this uh, potential immune rejection. So the work that we are looking here is how to induce or how to reprogram a somatic cell into a pluripotent stem cell-like. So this was achieved uh, three years ago in human cells by Shinya Yamanaka, and uh, he realized that both pluripotent stem cells as well as any other somatic cells they have their own identity because they, uh, they, they express or they have uh, factors that are specific to different cell types. So what Yamanaka did was systematically, so this, he decided to uh, add the pluripotent factors inside the somatic cells to overexpress these factors in the hope that he would find a combination of pluripotent factors that will now jumpstart the reprogramming process and at the end he will end up with a pluripotent, with induced pluripotent stem cells. And that's actually what he did. And we now know that this, uh, we are able to do that for several species. And uh, in, in the case of human cells, this has been attracted uh, a lot of attention because of the use uh, not only for transplantation purpose, but to model human disease. Let's take a mental disorder. You have a patient with a mental disorder. You can reprogram these cells back to this induced pluripotent state. And you can now drive the cells to differentiate in several cell types uh, that are present in the brain, such as neurons or astrocytes. These are all cell types in the brain. So you can then compare uh, the neurons from a patient that has the disease as well as for non-affected individual until you find what we call a cellular phenotype or what is the defect at the cellular level that may uh, be uh, connected to the mental disorder that the individual has. You can go on and move and study the connectivity between the cells, how these, these neurons connect to each other, how synapses are formed. And you can move, move on one more level and ask how the different cell types in the same tissue, such as brain, can actually interact with each other. And if you have uh, a specific defects at these different cell types, at different uh, levels of organization, you can induce, you can use that 
as a readout uh, for a purpose uh, of drug screening. So maybe you are able to find a drug, a new drug that can actually revert or rescue this defect, this uh, cellular defect, and you can move on into clinical trials and hopefully you can help the patient. So what I've been proposing here is to use this idea of induced pluripotent stem cells to study different species. So let's take all, all the primates here. We can uh, isolate uh, somatic cells, and this is really almost no invasive procedure, so you can use uh, a little bit of skin cells, and uh, skin biopsy, and you can propagate those cells, and you can use Yamanaka factors, or the, the technology that he developed to uh, make or to induce these uh, pluripotent cells, and you can then drive the cells to specialize or to differentiate in different cell types of the body. And once you have that, you can start asking how a human neuron is different from a chimp neuron. And once, if you find difference, you can start connecting uh, with uh, the genetics. So we hear a lot about the genetics and bones and also anatomy, physiology, and uh, behavior. So you can start linking all these uh, levels, uh, layers of organization to have like a great understanding of human evolution. So that was the goal. So, uh, the, the, the ultimate idea is to generate these induced pluripotent stem cells from all the primates, but we decided to focus on, on, on these two species, the bonobos and the chimpanzees, and compare them with humans. So you probably hear that, that humans and chimps, they, are, uh, they share like 99% of alignable sequence, and just a comparison, uh, we share like 50% of alignable sequence with the bananas. So they're really close species, but they have very different behaviors, very different anatomy. So to, to induce these really potent stem cells, we start with a fibroblast, these are skin cells, and we add the Yamanaka factors here, and you immediately see that after a couple of days, the morphology and the behavior of the cells will change. So fibroblasts, elongated cells, and they like to, uh, to grow in their own, so they are isolated. Uh, so when, they, uh, when we move those cells that has these pluripotent factors into this human embryonic stem cell condition, they immediately behave uh, uh, in, in a different way. So they start to get together to each other, and they actually resemble uh, human cells, uh, uh, cells from uh, the human blastocyst. So they were grown in this human condition. At this stage, they start to express pluripotent markers, such as TRA-189 and NANOV. These are uh, immunostaining to, uh, to visualize the, the presence of these pluripotent factors on these cells. So the factors were not there in the fibroblast state, but after this transformation, they start to, uh, to be expressed. So we also confirmed that there is no gross genomic anormality, so by just by doing like a G-bending karyotype, we can, we can check that actually they, sh they, they have the 48 chromosomes, and we repeat the same procedure uh, for uh, bonobos and also humans, and it's al always uh, good to see that the humans have like the 46 chromosomes compared to the 48 from the other primates. So one way to prove that the cells are really pluripotent is uh, to induce the cells to start to differentiate in what we call the embryoid bodies. So you lift the colonies from the plate, and these cells will start floating around, so there is no uh, attachment to, the, to, to a dish. And in the absence of growth factors, the cells will round up, and they will start to differentiate into the, these three germ layers. So the three germ layers are the layers uh, in early stages of the embryonic development that will give rise to different cell types and different tissues in the body. So we can confirm the presence of these uh, markers for the three gem layers by PCR. And uh, we, we have here the three species in the induced pluripotent state, and as well as in the embryonic body state. And the pluripotent markers are all highly expressed here, but they are down-regulated as soon as the cells start to differentiate. And you can see markers for the ecto, meso, and endoderm being up-regulated during this embryoid body formation. Another way to confirm that these cells acquire a state of pluripotency is to induce uh, teratoma formations in immunocompromised animals. So uh, teratomas are uh, solid tumors that has an embryonic or origin. And when you uh, analyze uh, sections from teratomas, you can actually see several cell types, and uh, you can label these cells from the different uh, uh, germ layers. So you, 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 you assure yourself that the cells can differentiate in different cell types. So 
And then once we are convinced that we can make these pluripotent stem cells from the different species, the question is what kind of cell type would be ideal to study? We can study uh, neurons, muscles, or cardiomyocytes, heart cells. So virtually we can study any cell type, but because uh, uh, myself and, and, and my group are a bunch of neuroscientists, we are brain crazy, we decided to focus in the brain. So what kind of difference one would expect uh, to see in the brain? So there are lots of reports that uh, the, the brain, uh, the human brain, uh, have a different genetic expression compared to the other species. There is also a clear brain size and organization. So I doubt the, uh, the skull size of uh, all the primates are roughly comparable. The actual cranial capacity and uh, the brain size of humans are way much larger compared to the other uh, primates. So this is uh, just an indication that we should, we should start to see some, some of uh, those differences regarding uh, brain size and organization as well as gene expression. So then we start making neurons. So let's induce those cells to become functional neurons. So it's a, it's a highly complex protocol and takes time. But uh, briefly, what we do is we take advantage of these embryoid bodies. So they already have the three germ layers. And we plate these embryoid bodies in a neural condition. And as soon as they reach this neural condition, they start to form what we call the neural rosettes. So these resemble early stages of neurotube formation. And at this stage, they already express some neural markers. So if you dissociate these cells, you can have like a more homogeneous population of neuroprogenitor cells. And those neuroprogenitor cells can now give rise to, uh, uh, to neurons and, and glial cells from the brain. So here is just uh, examples of neurons from the three species. Uh, actually, to visualize the neurons, we, we develop a tool that will uh, express the green fluorescent marker in, uh, only in neuronal cells. So we can distinguish the neurons from other cell types that are in there. And uh, those green uh, positive cells will also express other neuronal markers, such as synapsin or TG1. And because we have that, that uh, ability to visualize the neurons, live neurons, we can actually uh, use a small glass pipette and patch clump these neuronal cells, and, and we can actually record electrophysiologically and to, to confirm that they can actually fire action potential. So they behave as uh, functional neurons in a dish. All right, so then, then once we have those neurons, there are several possibilities. We can start uh, looking for things that are different between uh, the three species or uniquely uh, uh, about the, the human neurons. So one way that we decided to, uh, to move on and just to start uh, getting to the field was to, to, uh, to check for gene expression. So this is just some preliminary data, things that we, we, we are doing now and we, we start with uh, gene arrays and we are also incorporating some uh, next generation of uh, sequencing as well. So we decided to focus on isolated neurons. So we can isolate uh, these green cells using a fluorescent uh, uh, sorter, and we can compare the gene expression from these three species. So because there are so many genes, and, and here is just like plots of, of genes uh, comparing in humans against chimps, humans against bonobos, and chimps against bonobos, uh, and as you can see, there are some genes that are overexpressed in, in human neurons compared to, human ch to, to chimp neurons, and some other genes that are highly expressed in chimp neurons compared to, uh, uh, to human neurons. So basically, we have all kinds of possibilities. And these are, uh, uh, these are a lot of genes, way more than what we can handle. And because all of those genes have positive and negative interactions with other, it, it's really hard to, to work with uh, in individual genes. So, Usually, when we have this kind of situation, we try to, uh, to group those genes in se several uh, uh, categories, and uh, that's what we call a gene ontology. So this is just one way to, to, to group those genes to see if something makes sense. It's not ideal because the same gene can participate in different uh, molecular uh, pathways or different biological process. But yeah, you know, at least it shows you if there is something here to, to look around. So something that uh, calls our attention is that we start getting lots of these uh, biological process that is related to cell adhesion, locomotion, cell-cell interaction. And, and towards this point that there is probably something re regarding uh, neuronal migration that may be different between humans and chimps. 
So we are looking into that. But w would that make sense? Would be like a reasonable phenotype to, to look forward. So I think I think it is. I mean, uh, here is just uh, the brain size and, and ages. You can compare that the, the time that uh, the chimpanzee uh, brain will take to reach a plateau is probably like five uh, around five years uh, earlier than a human brain. So this is just one evidence for uh, neoteny or this retention of juvenile features in, in humans. And actually, I mean, if you if you look around, our heads look like a, a juvenile chimp. So there, this has implications uh, that are quite strong. So if you rush through development, you may compromise neuronal wiring. So you, you want to take your time. Uh, the brain needs time to, to make the proper connections and, and to mature in, in the proper manner. So that would be one implication. So would we be able to see such kind of phenotype in culture? So this is something that we are uh, actually looking uh, more and more. But I'll, and I don't have the answer now, but I'll, I'll give you an example. This is a, a one work that we published last year just to compare one uh, mental disorder, and I'm, I'll be talking about rat syndrome, uh, with no affected individuals. So rat syndrome is a neurodevelopmental disorder, and the kids apparently they are born, uh, they are normal for the first year or so, and then you see these loss of communication skills, motor coordinations, and, and some of them uh, present like seizures, and also they have this large spectrum of autistic behavior, so they are actually part of the autism spectrum disorders. So Rett syndrome is 90% caused by mutations in a gene called MECP2. So the lack of function of MCP2 gene can actually make the neurons be more uh, less complex compared to human neurons. So they will lose this complex arborization. And because of that, they are often used as a prototype for autism spectrum disorders. So, and we repeat the same protocol. So we start with Rett syndrome patients. They all carry muta different mutations in the MCP2 gene. We, uh, we use a skin biopsy to, to reprogram skin cells into this pluripotent state. And then we induce the cells to uh, form uh, neuronal networks in a dish. So when we compare uh, the control neurons, so these are no affected individuals with uh, affected individuals, we, we start to see our first phenotype, suggesting that uh, the soma size of affected uh, Rett syndrome patients are actually smaller, 10% is smaller in size compared to non-affected individuals. So this is one morphological alteration. Another morphological alteration that we realize is the, 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 uh, the density of uh, neuronal spines. So neuronal spines are uh, those uh, small uh, protrusions in neuronal process that actually uh, may, may, may be I mean, the actual structure where uh, the communication between neurons, the synapses, are formed. So we quantify these spines and we see that Rett syndrome neurons actually have a way a clear reduction in, in, in the number of spines when compared to controls. So we can now, because we know the genetic defect, what, something that we can do is, uh, is to artificially inactivate the gene in normal neurons. And that's what we do here. Uh, we can uh, remove the gene from these normal neurons. And we show that the treated neurons will, will have like a very similar phenotype to the disease neuron. And this is linking the genetic alteration to a cellular phenotype. So because uh, uh, these spines can, can actually uh, be the place where synapses are, are, are happening, we have uh, several antibodies against synaptic proteins. And we can use these antibodies to visualize the synaptic punctua. So because we can visualize, we can actually count the number of synaptic punctua along those processes. And again, what we see is a reduction in the number of uh, synapses in the affected neuron, in the red syndrome neurons, compared to controls. Can we manipulate the system somehow? So one way of, of doing that is by treating the affected neurons with some drugs. And what we did here is uh, we treat uh, the red syndrome neurons with insulin growth factor 1, IGF-1. So by doing that, we were able to completely rescue or to restore the number of synapses in the Rett syndrome neurons. So all of this just to illustrate that the system can actually uh, be a powerful system to link genetic alterations to a cellular phenotype. So 
another point uh, uh, I would like just to, to use this one more slide is to is, is a collaboration that's going on between uh, our labs and Caterina Semende Ferry here in anthropology department at CSED and we are looking uh, to try to reverse engineer the brain and one way to do that is to, to look for uh, regions in the brain that are different between humans and chimps and we can actually go on and laser capture those neurons and compare the gene expression of those neurons and see if we can get a valuable information and put that back into the iPS system and see if you can reproduce this difference from the iPS cells, the induced pluripotent stem cells. So I'll finish here by just confirming that uh, I, I think I, I, I gave you enough evidence to suggest that chimp bonobo and human genome can be captured in this pluripotent state and we can induce the uh, neuronal differentiation and we can start to compare gene expression as well as molecular uh, and cellular phenotypes. And the IPS model can be a useful tool to complement, incorporate, or add a valuable information to other evolutionary models. And the more we learn about ourselves, the more we learn about related species, the better for conservation purpose. And uh, this is uh, our APE team. I would like to thank uh, especially Carol Marqueto, who is really the leader of all of this. She's putting together all these different informations. And together with Bilal, they are looking for more cellular phenotypes. With Katarina, we are doing this reverse engineering approach. And more and more, uh, my group is, is getting involved with Gene Neo to learn more about gene expression. And as always, we always consult with Ajit and Pascal. So thank you very much. I think we'll move on to the next talk talking about a couple of extinct genomes, uh, the Neanderthals and the Denisovans. All right, so um, yeah, I'm Ed Green from uh, University of California, Santa Cruz, and I'm gonna talk to you about the genomes of uh, our closest extinct relatives, the Neanderthal and Denisovans. So in asking this question about uh, humanness and human uniqueness, we uh, tend to define this as how we are different from the things that are closest to us. And our closest living relatives, as we heard, are the other great apes, the chimpanzee, bonobo, the orangutan, and the gorilla. And this is a, a useful way to define human uniqueness because there are these things that are evolutionarily pretty close to us. The chimp and bonobo, as we've heard, are about six million years diverged. If we go back in time, six million years, there's no chimpanzee and there's no bonobo and there's no human, there's only the common ancestor of these two. And in the time since then, the last six million years, we have become different from this common ancestor as the chimpanzee has become different from the common ancestor and that's one way of saying how we are unique. What, what are these last few changes that happen since our common ancestor with chimp? We can carefully observe chimps, look at them and look at humans and make long lists and interesting lists of things that differ between humans and our closest living relatives. And these lists then are in some sense an answer to this question. What is it that is unique about humans? How are we um, different? Because every human individual starts with this genome, which resides on chromosomes that you get from your mother and your father. Everybody in the room started life as a single fertilized egg with largely just the information that's encoded on our chromosomes. Um, and it specifies these human differences. Every uh, human is completely heritable for these human characteristics and likewise for the chimpanzee. We would really like to know how this genetic information encodes these differences. What is it that differences between humans and chimps, what is this map between these genetic differences and the biological differences that we might care about? We can rephrase this question how are we unique and ask instead what makes us unique genetically and it's a good time to ask this question because we have lots of uh, genomes from the great apes soon we'll have all of those as we just heard and get something like a, a satisfying answer of all of the specific places where we differ from the things that are most similar to us there are about 35 million places in our genome where we're different than a chimpanzee and a few million insertions and deletions nine of our chromosomes have undergone these 
these inversions, and our chromosome number two is the result of a fusion event. Um, this second biggest chromosome exists as two discrete chromosomes in the other great apes. So this, then, is kind of the playing field for defining the genetic basis of human uniqueness. We've got these millions of things to look at genetically and long lists of biological and behavioral and physiological differences, and we'd like to make a map. But that's a hard problem. There are many millions of these things, and understanding the, the biology behind them, how the genetic information goes through all the steps that Ajik talked about um, through gene expression and protein expression and interacting with the environment to make the differences between humans and chimpanzees. So is there any way to make this easier? Is there anything that's closer? Well, there is, and I'll tell you about that in a second. But first, um, for this audience, I thought it might be fun just to um, do this thought experiment. We know that, as we just heard, orangutans are critically endangered. Their numbers are dwindling due to habitat loss. This is true for all of the great apes, um, except, for, except for one, except for us. The great ape that uh, likes to do math and write poetry is doing great. It's kind of a revenge of the nerd story where we are uh, taking over the world and all these other guys who don't do that are finding the place where they live going away. It took some time for us to uh, have this scientific enlightenment to, to formulate a, a model of evolutionary history where we put ourselves in the, in the proper place. This is despite the fact that there are these great ape species that are, are not so distantly related to us. If it had been the case instead that we reached this enlightenment and, and started really making progress with this after these guys were gone and were left instead only with our closest relatives being things with funny faces and tails, it might have been uh, an even harder thing for us to do as a species. Okay, so things that are closer are all dead, they're all extinct, but we find lots of their bones and we argue about how they are related to one another. This uh, hominid fossil record is a, um, a fairly uh, contentious thing. The broad strokes of this, I think, are, are pretty well settled. And one thing that is settled, our closest extinct relatives are these guys here, the Neanderthals. They are morphologically distinct group from humans, even from the modern humans that were contemporaneous with Neanderthals. So here is the cranium of a Cro-Magnon, the modern human, anatomically modern human, and from a classical Neanderthal. And if you look closely, you can notice some differences. There's this brow ridge and an occipital bun, and the brain case is lower and longer and slung back. And uh, postcranially, there are some other differences, but these um, focusing on the differences here kind of obscures the big picture story, which is that they're very similar to us morphologically in the context of the next closest thing that, that is still living, which is the chimpanzee. So Neanderthals and humans are, are morphologically very similar, and it turns out they're genetically very similar too. Temporally, Neanderthals show up in the fossil record about 200,000 years ago, and then they disappear about 30,000 years ago. Our species shows up about 130,000 years ago, and of course, we're still alive today. So for most of the time that we have been around and for most of the time that Neanderthals were around, we shared the planet together. It's only a, a rather recent development that we are the only hominin that walks around the, the, the world. So we overlapped in time. Neanderthals geographically are, are mainly known in Europe, but their range we know now extended into the Middle East and into Asia. And um, so they would be a very useful thing to study genetically, and it turns out that this is possible. Before I uh, start talking about that, I'm gonna um, do a little bit of the Ajit style kindergarten genetics. And it turns out that this is um, very necessary for um, explaining the genetic comparison between humans and Neanderthals, because unlike comparing us with other great apes or other species, the uh, genetic differences between humans and Neanderthals are largely not fixed differences. We talk about a human genome sequence and the orangutan genome sequence or the chimpanzee genome sequence. Of course, there are differences between humans and between orangutans and between um, uh, chimpanzees. And the difference between human and Neanderthal is largely the difference between humans who are alive today. And I'll explain why that's the case in a minute. But the, the point here of this slide is that kind of explaining inheritance in diploid sexually reproducing species like us. 
we get our genetic complement, our genome, from our dad and our mom. And our dad has two chromosomes, and our mom has two chromosomes that um, they got from both of their parents. If we imagine that these two chromosomes are just these intact bars here, the chromosome that comes from our dad was built just for us. It didn't exist in our dad at all in this way. Instead, it's a recombined version of the chromosome that your dad got from his dad and that your dad got from his mom. And after this recombination, you get this genetic material from your dad and likewise the same thing, this recombination happens in your mom. So if you look, if we say that the, the male is on top here, this part of your genome here came only from your dad's mom, not from your dad's dad. That bit of this chromosome is not represented by your dad's dad anywhere in your genome whereas this part is all your dad's dad. So this recombination that happens through every generation means that we have our own particular unique genealogy if we go back in time. At some place in our genome, we may have our dad's mom's dad's dad's mom's chromosome bit or our dad's mom's mom's dad's mom's dad's bit at that chromosome. And it turns out that you can reconstruct genealogies of, of, our, of any particular haplotype, any particular region in our genome amongst all people who are alive today. And um, this, in some sense, must be true. There must be this genealogy that unites everyone. You can take any two people in this room, find the haplotype at some place in their genome, and find the time that they had a common ancestor at that place in their genome. This must be true mathematically because we know that at every level of our own personal genealogy, we have a factor of two more ancestors. So 10 generations ago, you have about 1,000 ancestors. 20 generations ago you have about a million, 30 generations ago you have about a billion. Well, 30 generations ago, if we say 30 years per generation, this is in the Middle Ages. This is about year 1100. You have a billion ancestors. There weren't a billion people on the planet at that time. Even if every single person was an ancestor of you, there just aren't enough people so that it's different. So you coalesce with every other person that you might imagine on the planet at some place in your genome. Okay, so if we imagine now these trees that we have put together, looking at genetic diversity that's alive today, on average, humans coalesce, if you just take a random part of the genome and take two random people, two humans will coalesce, they'll have a common ancestor for that part of their genome about 450,000 years ago, okay? This is interesting with respect to Neanderthals because the population splits that would become Neanderthals and would become humans happened about 300,000 years ago, okay? So if we could go back in time 300,000 years ago, there are no humans and there are no Neanderthals. There's the common ancestor of this. Maybe we call this Homo erectus or Homo heidelbergensis. But that population that lived at this time, it harbored genetic diversity. There wasn't just one individual, there were multiple individuals and they had their own differences in their uh, genomes. And the diversity that was present then is largely the diversity that's present still today and was still present within Neanderthals until they went extinct. So at any particular place in your genome, you may be more closely related to a Neanderthal than you are to some other human. And in a different place in your genome, the, you may be more closely related to a human than you are to a Neanderthal. It just is the stochastic nature of um, this coalescent process and the fact that our gene trees are deep enough to include Neanderthals. Okay, so it's very useful then, it's very interesting to look at the genomes of Neanderthal because this is in, in a way just a deeply diverging human population that has genetic variation that's still alive today within us. Okay, so Neanderthals uh, sequencing DNA from things that have been extinct is, uh, falls in this field called ancient DNA, which got its start back in the mid-80s when DNA was sequenced from the first extinct organism, the quagga. And over the years, uh, more and more extinct organisms had DNA extracted and sequenced from it. These early days in ancient DNA were mostly using a technique called PCR, where you would take DNA out of a bone and try to amplify some intact fragment, and either it was there or it 
wasn't, and you would get some small sequence and try to make some sense out of this. 97, this was done for the first time in a hominid, the Neanderthal. This field has been revolutionized by this next generation sequencing that Elaine talked about. It's making everything cheaper. Next generation sequencing was not invented for ancient DNA, but um, it may as well have been. All of the weaknesses of next generation sequencing, the short read links, um, for example, they don't affect ancient DNA because the fragments that we get are usually so small that a longer read length wouldn't matter anyway. Okay, so the field has really moved toward this direct high throughput sequencing, next generation sequencing, and it's enabled genome scale projects of extinct organisms, not just looking at one or a few uh, targets at a time. Here's uh, what a few of the machines look like. What we have done is generate about one gigabase of data from these three bones, which are dated to about 40,000 years ago and came out of this cave in Croatia called Vindia Cave. And one of the things that we have seen from just doing massive amounts of sequencing from all of the DNA that comes out of bones is that very little of it, if we take all of the sequence data and align it to everything in databases of all sequence that's been done thus far, mostly what we see are things unlike anything we've ever seen before. If it does look like something in the databases, usually it's a soil living bacteria, and then just a few percent is Neanderthal. So mostly what the DNA that's in this bone is DNA from microbes that have colonized the bone in the 40,000 years that it's been sitting in the ground. But we focus on this few percent and um, have to sequence a lot to get up to genome scale coverage of the Neanderthal. As I said, we did a little over a gigabase from each of these three bones, a smattering of sequence from these other bones that didn't have as much DNA preserved, and now have a little over one-fold sequence coverage. Okay, so one very difficult thing about doing analysis of Neanderthal DNA, because they fall within the variation of modern humans, it's impossible for most of these small fragments, which are about 60 nucleotides long on average, it's impossible possible to look at this sequence and say that's Neanderthal or that's human because it's so similar. Most of these fragments will have no difference from human um, except for the uh, two or three percent of sequencing error that we get because it's ancient DNA. So to say for sure that it's really Neanderthal DNA, it turns out to be a very difficult thing. We did three different approaches to um, measuring the rate of human contamination. One was to look at the mitochondria. As Ajit mentioned, the mitochondria is maternally inherited. You have only one haplotype. You don't get it from mom and dad. You only get it from mom. So we don't have any heterozygosity to deal with there. We have complete mitochondrial sequence from these Neanderthals, and we identified 135 places in the genomes of this Neanderthal and all modern humans where every human looks different than this Neanderthal. So then every fragment that overlaps one of these positions, we can say, does it have the Neanderthal base or does it have the human base? And from uh, counting this, we get about 27,000 with the Neanderthal base, 73 with the human, and see that's less than 1% contamination. Likewise, we made this assay looking at the Y chromosome. These three bones happen to come from female Neanderthals. Females don't have Y chromosome, so the presence of any Y chromosome sequence is by definition then contamination. We saw four fragments that were unambiguously on the Y chromosome, and from this we can estimate less than 1% contamination. Another assay we did finally, looking in the, the nuclear genome, the autosomes, was comparing the genomes of five humans that we sequenced and look for places where two of the three Neanderthal bones, just looking at two of them, they differed from all five of these humans. So all five humans had one base and two of the three Neanderthals had a different base. In fact, they had the ancestral chimp base. And these are likely things that happen in humans early on and now all humans differ from all Neanderthals. And then once we identified these positions in two Neanderthals, we looked in the third one and asked, in this third Neanderthal, is it like the other two Neanderthals or is it like the human contamination? And did this in a round robin approach where you test each of the three hum uh, Neanderthal bones. And from this, we can estimate also less than 1% contamination. Contamination. So in this way, we bootstrapped ourselves into the Neanderthal genome. We didn't know what it was initially, and it's hard to imagine how you're going to know if it's Neanderthal sequence or not, given that you don't know any Neanderthal sequence. But these are the methods we came up with. Okay, so then comparing human, chimp, and Neanderthal sequence, aligning the three of them, we can ask how many differences are specific to the chimpanzee? How many places does the chimp have a different base? or the Neanderthal or the human. 
the Neanderthal, if we look at the bases where Neanderthal is different, what we see is there's this huge excess of C to T and G to A. This is characteristic of ancient DNA. There's a deamination process of cytosine. It gets chemically damaged and then it occurs to us as C's. It also causes the G's to be read as A's. This is not real evolutionary change. These are not changes that happen during Neanderthal evolution. They're chemical damage that happen in the DNA of this individual Neanderthal after it died. And also, we see a very high rate of all differences in the Neanderthal genome that we have, which is low coverage, single pass um, sequence reads of uh, this uh, Neanderthal individuals, and we're comparing it to finished genome of human and chimpanzee, which has a very low sequencing error rate. So what we're seeing basically here, if there's a position where the human and the chimp say one thing and Neanderthal says something else, it's almost um, always error the vast majority of those positions are just sequencing error. So saying something about Neanderthal specific changes is very difficult to do right now, despite the fact that we have about one fold coverage of the Neanderthal genome. The errors accumulate on this Neanderthal branch. However, this branch here is very interesting. These are places where the Neanderthal and the chimp have the same base and humans are different. This lets us say, what were the changes that happened recently in humans very recently, since we split off even from our closest extinct relatives, the Neanderthals. And if we just ask what is the fraction of positions that look like this versus look like this, we can estimate how long ago, on average, Neanderthals and humans diverged from one another. And it turns out that this is about 12.7% of the way back to this common ancestor. If you take your favorite time for this, six and a half million years or so, that means this is about 800,000 years. So the average genome coalescent between humans and uh, Neanderthals is about 800,000 years ago. Okay, so we also, because we coexisted for a long time, there was this open question forever um, whether there's any genetic relatedness between humans and Neanderthals. We know we lived at the same time and um, overlapped geographically even. So to address this, there was this uh, analysis devised by David Reich and Nick Patterson and Jim Mulliken, where we took the genomes from five humans that we sequenced um, who, who were from around the world, one person from France, one person from China, someone from Papua New Guinea, someone from South Africa, and someone from West Africa, and took all pairwise combinations, all two combinations of each of these, the Yorubas from West Africa and the, the French guy, and find places where they differ, where there's some allelic difference between these two people. And then ask, what does the Neanderthal have? Does it match the person from France or the person from Africa? If Neanderthals are a clean outgroup to all humans, if Neanderthals split off from humans before there was any Yoruban or French or Papua New Guinea, and if all of that was later, then Neanderthals should match these two equally often, it should be 50-50. But it turns out, so here are the five humans that we sequence, it turns out that it's not 50-50. It is 50-50 if you compare the two Africans against each other. Neanderthal is equally similar to San as to Yoruba. It's also equally similar to any of the non-Africans that we compared. Any pairwise combination of the three non-Africans. It looks just as much like a French guy as it does someone from Papua New Guinea or Papua New Guinea as a Han Chinese. These are all statistically indistinguishable from 50-50. However, any combination between African and non-African, there was a, a small but very statistically significant excess matching between Neanderthal and the non-African. There's a closer genetic relationship between Neanderthals and all non-Africans than um, Africans. And this is interesting because this is the case even for the Papuan sample, even someone from Papua New Guinea, where Neanderthals are never known to have been and almost certainly never were. We still see this signal of admixture in people who live there today from Neanderthals. So um, this is uh, what that analysis looks like. These two are similar to each other. Any of these three are similar to each other, but any comparison between the two, there's more relationship between the non-African. So this is the model that we have to explain it. One to four percent of the uh, genetic ancestry of any non-African now can be attributed, uh, traced back to 
Neanderthal. Probably this admixture event happened very early on when humans migrated out of Africa and first came into the Neanderthal range. They picked up this Neanderthal genetic component and then took it with them as they went over the rest of the world. This probably small population then expanded, so we see this in roughly equal proportions all over the world. Okay, so that's the Neanderthal genome. The Denisova is a, um, another sample that we found recently that has a very deeply diverging mitochondria sequence. Humans and Neanderthals are sister groups with respect to Denisova and the mitochondria. Not true in the nuclear genome. The Denisova versus the Neanderthal is about the same divergence, which is kind of odd. They appear to be a sister group, and in fact, if you look at allelic differences, Denisova is a sister group with Neanderthals in the nuclear genome um, compared to humans. So they're a very deeply diverging population that's more distinct from Neanderthals than any two populations who are alive today are, but they're more closely related to Neanderthals than they are to humans. We did this same admixture analysis and shockingly found that there is a very strong signal of excess similarity between the Denisova and people who today live in Papua New Guinea and not in these other places, a wider sample for this analysis. So in the last 30 seconds, I would like to um, tell you um, another application of the Neanderthal data and really the reason that we uh, started this project in the first place, um, and that is, the genealogy of humans versus Neanderthals across most of the genome looks like this. But what we would like to do is find the places where it looks like this, where there's some adaptive mutation that happened in humans since we split from Neanderthals and was selected, uh, conferred some advantage, so it was selected and is now fixed in humans, places where all humans are more related to each other than they are to Neanderthals. And <laughs> graphically, that looks like this. Sometime uh, in the past, we got the uh, mutation that led us do anything that's human unique with respect to Neanderthals, and we see this in all humans now. So that screen is something we're implementing and running now to find the genetic basis of uniqueness that separates even humans from our closest extinct relatives, the Neanderthals. These are um, some of the key people who worked on this project. A real visionary behind this invented the field of ancient DNA and has been driving this project for decades is uh, my former boss, Fante Pabo, and these other guys are uh, very important people who worked on various aspects of this. And um, if you're ever in beautiful Santa Cruz, come by and see me. Thanks.